Ezekiel saw the wheel. He saw that wheel. Way in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. In the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. This will be a discussion of the forces that get us to move, the dynamics of biologic systems. And I will use my friend Serge Krakowiecki to start the discussion. I've known Serge Krakowiecki for 40 years. In addition to his giving some of the best and most humorous lectures ever, he has provoked me into thinking thoughts that I would never have thought of without his input. One of them is, Species survival is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Simply put, if there's a less energetic way of doing something, organisms will find it. During my stint in the military, I learned the soldier's second law of thermodynamics. Never stand when you can sit. Never sit when you can lie down. Never stay awake when you can be asleep. Serge points out that muscles are gas guzzlers and animals must minimize their use. This boils down to getting maximum movement while using minimal effort. Movement has two components, horizontal velocity and a vertical force vector, usually related to gravity. Together they produce motions that resemble a sine wave and the oscillations of a pendulum of spring. The resemblance to pendulums and springs has not gone unnoticed and was remarked on by Borelli, who is considered to be the father of biomechanics, in 1680. Over the centuries, running has been thought of as using a different mechanism than walking. There were two models for movement the pendulum model for walking, and the spring mass model for running. A key difference is that the center of mass is the high point in the pendulum model, but the low point in the spring mass model. In the usual models, both use a push off from the ground and braking as the foot hits the ground. The concept of propulsion and braking is the same, except in the pendulum model, push off is powered by internal muscles and and in the spring mass model, the springs are powered by the ground reaction force in response to the body loading the ground. To me, this is a giant step forward as it uses gravity instead of gas guzzling muscles to move us around. Current thinking is moving to a spring mass model for walking and running. The spring mass model has its origin in the early 1800s when Carnot wrote about the body of springs, but it's only in the last several years that anyone has paid uh, any attention to his work. I think we can now say that both walking and running are based on spring mass models. The most accepted model, but not what I subscribe to, is the leg-driven spring mass model with the spring primarily in the calf muscles, tendons and ligaments being loaded by the body weight as it hits the ground. The foot pushes against the ground and the ground pushes back. The lever raises the heel from the ground and the, and the body is pushed upward. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that the springs cannot produce mechanical energy they can only return energy loaded previously by an external force. We have lift off. We have lift off. Let us try and clarify what we mean by push off and lift off. Push off is when two opposing forces interact with each other and there is an equal and opposite reaction. A springboard pushes the person into the air. Push off. Liftoff is when the stored energy within a system uses that energy to pull away from the interface on which it was resting. Helicopters and rockets lift off. They lift themselves off the ground. They do not push away from it. Before we go much further, let's review a few principles about forces that we will apply to body in motion. I touched on it briefly at the very beginning, 
and here's more of it from accelerated speed training. So force has a very specific direction, and it produces acceleration specifically in that direction. So let's say this is a, we'll call it a resultant vector. We can break this up into smaller component vectors, which are perpendicular. Okay. Now we're going to make those component vectors perpendicular because perpendicular forces have no influence on each other. So when it comes to problem solving, uh, you want to make all your forces perpendicular so you can treat each direction separately. Okay, it makes things very simple. Uh, perpendicular forces have no influence on each other. Uh, a force cannot produce, produce acceleration that is perpendicular to that force. All right, so vertical force can't produce horizontal acceleration. Horizontal force cannot produce vertical acceleration. Uh, very important concept to understand. I hope you've got the point. Vertical and horizontal forces are separate and do not affect each other. Any vectored force that is not horizontal or vertical is always an hypotenuse of those two forces. And in case you missed it, here is a bullet being fired from a gun, assuming the gun is horizontal, which hits the ground first, the ejected uh, cartridge or the bullet traveling on its horizontal path. They hit the ground at the same time because the horizontal speed of the bullet has nothing to do with the vertical forces uh, pulling the bullet to the ground. And one more time, why does the stone bounce and not sink? There's a horizontal force that propels it, and if there's a slight bounce of the water, that delays its sinking. It will propel forward. Because there is drag from the water, it is slowed until the forward motion is stopped and finally sinks. If there were no drag, the forward motion would continue on indefinitely. This is Scott Turner, professor of biology at Syracuse University. As of January 2022, uh, this video is still up on the internet. In fact, on this prestigious Academia EDU channel. So it probably is part of his present thinking. Uh, the video is directed at the pendulum model, but much of it applies to any leg driven model. Just to remind ourselves, walking involves the forward motion of the body as it pivots around the ankle and hip joints. As the body moves forward, it describes an arc over an angle theta that is part of a larger circle of radius L, the length of the leg. Remember, we have described here the half stride. Let's analyze the forces at work. To propel the body forward, there must be a forward force C that acts parallel to the arc. This force C must act against the weight of the body, W, which is always oriented vertically. Here's a close-up of those forces, just so we can see them more clearly. Work must be done to initiate the half stride, and this work is oriented in the direction of the force C. This work comes from the muscles. Only once sufficient work has been done to elevate the body's center of mass to the top of the arc, can gravity act to complete the half stride? Let's look at this a bit deeper. Professor Turner is talking about the pendulum model. We learned in first year physics that an external force is needed to move a body at rest. Muscles are internal forces, and if W is an external force, which it is, then you need an external force to move it, which is Newton's first law. This invalidates the pendulum model. So it is clear where we're going. Let's do a bit of math. C is the direction where the body is moving. As Tony Sabanos taught us, we can vector those forces into two components, a vertical and a horizontal component. 
C1G is a force that gets us up into the air. It has to be an external force. It is uh, equal and opposite to W. W being the accelerating force of the body hitting the ground, and there is an equal and opposite ground reaction force. As pointed out by Dr. Turner, and I fully agree with him on this, W cannot produce a horizontal acceleration. And muscles acting on their own cannot produce a significant vertical force. So then how do we get the body to move? So let's step back a bit and look at this diagram again. Since muscles acting on their own can't move us, we need an external force. Here is where the spring mass model comes in. The springs in our bodies are loaded by the ground reaction force, stores the energy and puts it back into the system. But that only pushes us straight up into the air. How do we get the horizontal force? As Tony told us, Vertical forces can only produce vertical acceleration. Horizontal forces can only produce horizontal accelerations. So in response to W, forces can only push up, they cannot push forward. So what forces propel us forward? The present model has been one of underfoot push off and braking. As you can see, Push-off and braking require frictional shear. In this limb-driven model, the foot shears against the, the surface of the earth and pushes back, giving us push-off. As my friend Grekovetsky would tell you, shear is the enemy. It is wasted energy and inconsistent with the second law of thermodynamics is applied to biologic structures. Is there underfoot shear when running? These are footprints of runners on a beach of both dog and man, showing that there is no shear underfoot. Neither man nor beast create forward motion by underfoot shearing. But there is a very simple and energetically efficient way of creating forward motion. All one has to do is lean forward so the center of mass is in front of the base of support. And you can see by vectoring the forces uh, as Tony said we should, we end up with a downward motion and a forward motion. And gravity does the work for us. And it gets better. We are sliding over frictionless joints. So once we get going, there's really nothing stopping our forward motion except the wind. Although our foot may stop forward motion briefly as it touches ground, all the body parts from the ankle on up are happily moving along obeying Newton's first law unimpeded by frictional drag. Second law of thermodynamics wins again. Evidently, some athletes and coaches are a bit ahead of what is in the biomechanics literature. Here is Mike Maggio, a walking coach. As we walk, our center of mass needs to be directly over the ball of our foot as the foot hits the ground. Your heel will strike first and then the ball of the foot. We want to have the majority of the weight of our body directly over the ball of our foot with a bent knee. We don't have to push. Gravity will pull us forward and we're on to our next foot. He is talking about gravity uh, moving him forward and the foot being lifted off the ground. The center of mass pushes down when the center of mass is directly over the ball of the foot. Gravity pulls us forward and there's no push off. The principle is the same in running. Here is a runner talking about the same techniques using what is known as the pose method for walking and running. Pushing off is nothing more than wasted energy. You can do it in the vertical direction, but it doesn't help you with horizontal movement. Just the simple act of allowing yourself to fall forward is all you need to generate or maintain your forward momentum. You can fall a maximum of 22 and a half degrees past the vertical. Once you're there, it's time to pull your foot up. 
The paw deck is the idea that upon contacting the ground, the muscles in the legs somehow grip the ground and literally pull the body forward. Realistically, this can't happen. Our muscles alone can't propel the body forward faster than the already existing momentum. We keep talking about the center of mass, but we really haven't stressed its importance in understanding movement. Here is my favorite physics professor, Walter Lewin from MIT, explaining its importance. The center of mass is very, very special indeed. It has remarkable qualities and characteristics, and they are not so obvious at all. Of the center of mass. And if I take the derivative of this, then dpdt of the total momentum of which we learned that the total momentum dt, dpdt, is the total external force. We already learned that earlier. I take the derivative of this equation that gives me dpdt here, and the velocity changes to acceleration. And look at this. This is really an amazing statement. This says f equals ma. But if I have here this quash racket, and here is the center of mass, then if I throw this object up in 26100, as I will do later, then the center of mass behaves as if all the mass of the entire squash racket was right at that center of mass. So the behavior of the center of mass is extremely predictable, whereas the behavior of the squash racket is not. It may start tumbling of mass. If I had here a hammer, this is a hammer, and there were no external forces. I would be somewhere in outer, in outer space, and it would have a certain velocity. Then the center of mass, but only the center of mass, would have a velocity that never changes, because if there's no external force, then there is only a constant velocity. There's no acceleration. But the hammer itself may be tumbling. A little later in time, the hammer may have this position. A little earlier in time, the hammer may have had this position. Follow the, the green line. It's just one smooth motion. That is very mysterious that there is one and only one point in any one of us, in you, in me, in any object, that the center of mass behaves as if all the matter were together in one point. Of course, the physicist Krakowiecki knew this and wrote a book, The Spinal Engine, describing just that. Movement is from the center out, not from the periphery in. His video of a quad amputee demonstrating mobility through spinal movement is a classic. My take on this is that it is springs, not muscles, that fuel this engine. Unfortunately, Serge's book is out of print. With a little updating, it should be republished. I took this photo of mother and daughter walking in Guatemala several years ago, fortuitously caught them in what is called double leg stance, but I see them as floating on air. I see mother and daughter at about where the markers are at 46 and 94% of the walk phase. In the spring mass model, the low point of the center of mass occurs at single leg stance, depicted here at about 32 and 82 or 3 percent of the walk phase. As they are being sprung up into the air at single leg stance, they are less than full weight bearing between left and right single leg stance. At the apex, which is just about where they are now, they must pretty much be airborne. And we now know that that hind foot is not pushing off, but being lifted off, and therefore non-weight bearing. So the center of mass is being sprung up into the air. It moves forward by being propelled by inertia and gravity. And until the center of mass is directly over the ball of the foot, the walker is airborne. Let's revisit Carnot and his body springs. As you recall, an animal may be considered an assembly of particles separated by compressed springs. This chart depicts all sorts of springs in the body, but they left out what I consider the most important springs in the body, the bones. 
The usual discussion around springs in the leg always concerns itself with muscles. For some unknown reason, no one considers the bones. But of course, bones are much better springs than muscles, and Carnot did not exclude them from his description. When you load sp stiff springs like bone and softer springs like muscles in parallel, it's the stiff springs that do all the work. Live bones are not the stiff, brittle rods that we are accustomed to see in the cadaver bone. They are bouncy and springy, much like a live tree limb. And they are not compressed from the ends like a Greek column, but rather tugged on all along its shaft by the myriad muscle and ligament transpositions. And where does all that tension come from? It has to come from the ball of the foot when the center of mass is directly over it. This is a tensegrity tower built by Bruce Hamilton sitting in my front hallway. And here it is oscillating after a gentle push. It would be just as correct to call it a spring as calling it an oscillator. Enmeshed in a continuous tension network, all the compression struts are compressed equally and operate in parallel. As this is the model for the structure of organisms, then all the compression elements of an organism must be compressed equally and in parallel. I would like to try and clear up a bit of confusion about series and parallel. In physics, series refers to events occurring one after another. Parallel is when events are occurring simultaneously and towards the same goal. Series is like a link chain with each link attached one after another. Parallel is more like the fibers of a hemp rope that are entwined with each other. As we all know, a weak link in a chain will destroy the continuity of the whole chain. They work in series, and if one doesn't work, they all don't work. In parallel, they can work all together, but not dependent on each other so that if one fails or not functioning, the others can still do their job. They are simultaneously independent and interdependent. Springs spread out in the series get longer and flimsier and are never stronger than its weakest link. Parallel forces are additive, the more the merrier. Muscles and bones working together become co-workers rather than agonists and antagonists. If tension begets compression, and bones are set in, in a continuous tension network, compression elements in a biological tensegrity are compressed in parallel. I want you to meet Theo Janssen and his strand beasties that stroll along the Netherlands beaches powered only by the wind. Their limbs move by a unique closed kinematic chain mechanism, eponymously and rightly named the Jensen mechanism. It looks very complicated, but uh, to simplify things, let's get down to the basic mechanism, which is a closed kinematic chain driven by a crank. This closed kinematic chain is analogous to the pentagraph, the sliding crank, the vector equilibrium, the Jacob's Ladder, and the cruciate ligaments of the knee that we have discussed in our article about closed kinematic chains in biological organisms. Closed kinematic chains are ubiquitous in the body. It is demonstrated here in the antibody modeling system showing the quadriceps and the hamstrings co-contracting, phenomena first described by Lombard in 1903. And here it is being used to model the expansion and contraction of a virus. Back to the Theo Jensen mechanism. Like all kinematic chains, it is powered by a crank, which is powered by an external force. And it rotates around a center of mass, and its movement is three-dimensional, not planar. Now let's flip it upside down and recognize that all those elements are springs, and what is now powering that crank is the ground reaction force. 
Those forces then focus on the center of mass and it gets a potential energy, which then can convert to kinetic energy, which moves the structure. And let's put a human element into this. It's a baseball pitcher throwing a ball that could have been a model for the Janssen mechanism. And another describing how the power comes from the center of mass. You want it open just a little bit, and then your arm, like I said, your arm just goes along for the ride. I think you should hear that again. Like I said, your arm just goes along for the ride. As Grakovetsky pointed out in 1980, it's a center of mass thing. Of course, some form of walking and running is central to all activities in all creatures. It doesn't matter who's doing what, all movement in all creatures behave as if it is coming from a central point to center of mass. The toe bone hits the neck to the heel bone. The heel bone hits the neck to the foot bone. The foot bone hits the neck to the ankle bone. Walking and running is so fundamental that you would think the mechanisms were figured out long ago. Not so. Let's go back to the first slide where I talked about dynamics as being a branch of classical mechanics that is concerned with the study of forces and their effects on motion. The other branch of mechanics is statics, which is used to analyze systems that are not going anywhere. They're stuck in static equilibrium. Although articles and books were written about the motion of animals, most of what was written was really about statics and not dynamics of animal mechanics. Borelli is considered to be the father of modern-day biomechanics, and the principles he espoused in his book on the motion of animals in 1680 has essentially remained unchallenged until this day. It is static mechanics with muscles supposedly doing all the work by pulling levers. Some seven years after Borelli's death, Newton published his Principia Mathematica, in which he elucidated the laws of motion and gravity. And I suspect that if Borelli hung around a few more years and learned from Newton, he would have written a much different book. Movement is complex and swift and difficult to easily analyze until the 1890s when Moybridge did this remarkable series of photographs. These were done at one of my alma maters, the University of Pennsylvania, a few semesters before I matriculated there. They were done on a series of photographic plates and were the precursor to motion pictures. For the first time, motion could be analyze not just step by step, but fraction of a second to fraction of a second. Early on, there did not seem to be much interest amongst the scientists, but the artists seemed to pay attention. The science underlying biological dynamics really came into its own in the 1970s, with McNeil Alexander playing a major role in its development. His studies on the hopping kangaroo are a classic, and I pay homage to that work right from the beginning of this talk. A key finding was that kangaroos stored a lot of their energy in the springs in their legs, and they got that energy from the bounce on the ground, the ground reaction force. This was a key finding because it meant that the bounce in our step may be energized by external forces rather than internal forces, the muscles. But Alexander's work needs to be upgraded, and that gets us to Serge Grekovetsky's pithy aphorisms. Using internal springs powered by an external energy source makes a lot of thermodynamic sense. And the same can be said by replacing internally powered muscles with externally powered springs. And we mustn't forget that shear is the enemy. And any way that an organism can reduce shear is a victory for the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> 
And that gets us back to the engineer mathematician Carnot. We should be looking at ways to get maximum movement with minimum effort. An apparent excellent way to do it is to bring in those forces from outside the body into it using our springs. That would be the most suitable. There are a few models out there using spring mass systems. They seem to be simple models focusing on the legs as springs. Some more sophisticated models have used springs with dampers. But only one model I found is thought to include Carnot's concept that the entire body may be springs. But the root model being used is Borelli's lever model, and that model functions in series. And as we have discussed previously, springs in series are more likely to weaken a system than they are to strengthen a system. I cannot envision series springs as a useful model for dancing such as depicted here, where it is quite apparent that many of the body springs are operating simultaneously and in parallel. As we have already noted, tensegrity is a springs, and that's made even clearer in Ingberg's model made entirely with springs. There are tension springs and compression springs. nonlinear springs, and probably a few more that are not germane to this talk. The compression elements of a tensegrity, and they would be the bones in a skeletal system, and they themselves are tensegrities, function as compression springs, but they are nonlinear compression springs and can function much like shock absorbers in your automobile. The interstitial fascia, the ligaments, tendons, and muscles all can be represented as tension springs. In a tensegrity tower, they would be represented by the tension cables. If muscles are being used isometrically and isotonically, as they frequently are, then they may best be represented as turnbuckles that adjust the tension in the closed kinematic chain rather than just simple springs. And that brings us back to the heart of the subject the center of mass. The center of mass is very, very special indeed. And to understand why, all you have to do is watch Simone Biles' vault. Thanks for this time we had together. Connect her to the ankle bone. It's easy to connect her those dry bones.